This is an Australian $10 note, and sadly, this is all I've got left because I had to reactivate my very first accounting software to pull through all the invoices that I made back in 2016 to show you in this video. So if you appreciate that, please make sure you gently smash that like button. Maybe also grab another friend, grab your family, grab everyone to gently smash that like button over and over again. Now remember, this is part two of the three part series of how I became a seven figure UI and UX designer with zero design experience. I also want to say thank you everyone so much for all the support, the comments, and the really good feedback about the series. And I want to reinforce the notion that this series is really created to help anyone around the world that want to get started as a designer and really want to succeed and build their own design agency or freelance full time with practical tips and true transparency because I know not many people actually share with you all the numbers and the secrets behind their journey. So if you haven't seen part one, make sure to gently smash that link above because that will give you a lot of understanding and also context about what I'm about to talk to you and about to share with you in part two. So fast forward to 2016, I had spent a year and a half at freelancer.com, another year and a half at High Pages, and in 2016, I finally decided to jump out to freelance full time. And this time round, I was taking it very seriously and I also registered Mizco Media so the very first question is, how did I attract international clients when I was freelancing? So before I actually started freelancing, back in 2013 when I was still at freelancer.com, my design lead and manager at the time, Adam Dunaway, who also has a very strong personal brand, suggested and recommended me to start building my very own personal brand for my design career. So in doing so, I thought about redesigning my portfolio and also launching it with a bang. And just like every other junior designer, I had these crazy wacky ideas and mine was to get dressed up as a ninja and then claim to be this web design ninja of the internet. So as you can see, I have this black singlet wrapped around my face with this massive orange peg that clipped it tightly around my face. I animated myself out from the side and then voila, I bang out and I jump out from the bottom of the screen. Now when the website was ready, I was actually very nervous and very anxious about launching it to the World Wide Web. I, did, I wasn't sure how comfortable I was about people seeing me dressed up as a ninja with a massive peg pegged to my face. However, my colleague Deborah at the time suggested and really pushed me to just launch it and see what people would say. So that's what I did. I actually went to cssmania.com, I went to awards.com, I went to the FWA, I went on LinkedIn and also on Twitter and I literally just blasted myself out to the World Wide Web. Now, this was a very critical moment in my life. Oh, and by the way, if you guys are enjoying this video, make sure to like, but more importantly, subscribe because then you get notified about when part three of this three part series about how I became a seven figure UI and UX designer, when it becomes available. Back to the video. And that day I learned one key lesson in life. Get uncomfortable and be different if you really, really want to get yourself out there and if you really want to differentiate yourself. To my surprise, people actually loved the design portfolio that I was once very nervous and anxious about. The website got a lot of traction. People shared feedback about how funny, how comical, how relatable it was. And ultimately, it landed me numerous, countless international leads from clients from all over the world. This truly made me realize that if you really do want to stand out, if you really want to get international clients, if you want to get international awareness, and if you want to really get yourself out there, you can't look just like everyone else. You have to do things that are going to be very different, that are really going to stand out to get people's attention. And this also made me realize that you can be great at whatever you do, but if you can't and you struggle to build awareness about your services or the value that you can provide clients, then really whatever you have to provide is better off just hidden off in the closet. So one thing about if you want to get international awareness is ask yourself, what are you doing right now that is really different to what everyone else is doing? And Seth Godin, who is claimed to be the godfather of marketing, has a great book about purple cow. How can you be that purple cow? How can you be different? When someone is driving out in the countryside and you see a bunch of cows out there, how can you be that one random purple cow that's gonna make heads turn? Now the second question is, when should you freelance full time? Now if you realize with my very own journey, I went from freelancing to full time role, back to freelancing, 
back to full-time role, then back to full-time freelancing. I've tried it three times. And the reason why I've done this is, and the reason why I made the decision to go back into a full-time role is because this allows you to one, meet the right people, build the right networks, but more importantly, you can start to deepen your experience and your knowledge in the specific skill set that you plan to sell as a freelancer moving forward. The one great thing about working within a large organization is that you then get to also understand how does your discipline, your team work with other teams and it broadens your horizons and it also broadens your experiences that you can also sell. But the one thing that I really valued while working in large organization is that I could see exactly how businesses are run, how they're built, how they're structured, and just the day-to-day -day operations of things. I didn't want to go into freelancing blindly, trying to figure out how to build a business, how to sell my services, and also trying to figure out how to do my job as a designer. So my recommendation for you is, always start freelancing as a part-time passion side hustle. Have a full-time role where you're learning and you're bringing all, all this knowledge and you're also bringing in stability in terms of income and then freelance on the side. This also allows you to also build your personal brand on the side without the external stress of having to make money to pay bills. Because if you decide to jump out to freelance full-time right away, not only are you trying to learn the ropes of actually running a business and starting a business, you're also tr stressed about trying to bring in income, you're trying to advertise about your services, you're trying to get the work done. There is just too much stress and anxiety for you to perform at your best. So for my personal recommendation is spend at least three to five years working within an organization so you can get comfortable in deepening your experience as a designer and ultimately learning how businesses are run, how they're structured, so you can understand when you decide to freelance, you don't go in blindly. Now that big question that you guys have all probably been thinking about, how did I get and land my very first clients when I went freelancing full time? So let's get right into it guys. Here we have my very first FreshBooks account, which was the accounting software that I used back in 2016 when I first jumped out to freelance. I had to pay 25 bucks to reactivate this account. It was extremely old, but here you can see all the invoices that I had issued out in 2016 when I first started to freelance all the way through to 2017, which then I ultimately decided to change to go to zero.com, which had a lot more capabilities in terms of inviting my bookkeeper, my accountant, and managing my finances. So if you take a look at the first few projects that I ever secured, these are actually very small projects which were in the hundreds and in the low thousands. Now, to be clear, the very first project that I actually secured was from a Facebook group. So the great place to find really good leads is whatever country you're from, whatever city you're from, I'm sure there is a startup or entrepreneur or founder group where local founders come together to talk about their business. A lot of these companies are looking for designers to help them build out their app, their software, and their website. So I was quite active in these local Sydney groups of founders and entrepreneurs, and I would actually reach out, share my work, share the things I'm working on, and that would actually bring in awareness to my services. So the very first project that I secured for $2,640 AUD was from a local Facebook group. Then you see, is 825. This one was secured via LinkedIn because like I said, I was always constantly sharing my work on LinkedIn as well. This is also a great place for you to find and to secure quality leads because LinkedIn is the social network for business people. That's where they spend most of their time. So once again, I secured that through LinkedIn. Then you, you see a project secured for 5,500, that 3,300. This was actually a contract role with one of the companies that I worked for with full time. I don't wanna name which company it was, but once again, if you were moving out into freelancing, the reason why working in a full time role previously is also good is because you get to build up those networks. And sometimes when you move into freelancing, you might feel a little bit anxious because you don't have the stability of the income flowing in. Now, if you work full time for a number of years, let's say three to five years, you would have built up enough of a network to actually reach out to the companies that you worked for to see if they have additional work that you can help them with. So with a couple of these contracts, as you can see on, 
uh, on this line, this line, also on this line, and on this line for 3,300, these were engagements with companies that I had worked for before. So once again, you've already built the trust, you've already built the network, so it's a lot easier for you to secure them as a freelancing client moving forward. And that is why I always recommend people to at least spend three to five years in the industry because it just it's so beneficial. There is no rush to getting into freelancing. You've got the rest of your life to do so. And then you can see that I've got another project here for 3,750. This was a local Sydney startup. I actually don't quite remember where that came from. But ultimately, then we have another project here for $1,000. This was actually discovered through a co-working space that I was working at. And this will lead into a secondary point about how you can generate more leads in your freelancing career. But as you can see here, within the first year, within 2016, I had secured just around $2,226 um, in terms of project. Now, I also wanna share with you another great way that can help you generate a lot of leads. And you could see that in 2016, even though that was my very first year, I was still able to generate a lot of leads is because I positioned myself in an environment where I could actually pull in a lot of leads. And have a think about it, I'll give you five seconds to think about it. What can you do and where can you position yourself to be surrounded by people who want your services? So five, four, three, two, one co-working spaces. So what I did was I strategically moved my office from home to a co-working office in the CBD of Sydney because I knew for a fact that there was at least a hundred startups in that co-working space. Now, if I could just secure 10% of those startups, that's 10 startups out of a hundred, that is more than enough work to pay off the entire operation of all the expenses that were going through the business at the time. So one thing for you to think about is if you're looking to freelance, yes, you wanna keep your costs down at the start, but once you bring in some revenue and once you're starting to save every, every single dollar that you make, you can then reinvest that money to help you make more money, more revenue. And that can also come through where you position yourself while you're working. So if you position yourself within a co-working space, you are gonna be surrounded with opportunities and all you have to do is reach out to people, let them know about the service that you do, and if you do great work, they're gonna tell other people, other friends within the same co-working space and you will become highly demanded. Now another tip for you to secure more leads at the start is to literally say yes to everything. You might have noticed that I had invoices getting generated and sent out every single week of the month. Now, some of them were just a couple of hundred dollars, some of them were a thousand dollars, some of them were four thousand dollars. To me, when I first started out, I said yes to everything because I had no leverage. When you're building a business, when you're coming out as a freelancer, what you need to focus on is getting as much work under your belt because this is ammunition for you while you are doing a sales pitch. If you don't have any case studies, if you don't have any work that you can showcase and explain to a potential client about what sort of impact you were able to provide a business, then you have no leverage. So the only way for you to get there is to actually do more work. And how do you get more work when you have no leverage? It's to say yes to everything, no matter what price point it is. Now, once you've done enough work and you've started to build your, your repository of case studies, then you can start to have more leverage and that is when you can start thinking about increasing your rates. So back to my fresh books. If you notice, when I first started freelancing, the projects were averaging anywhere between a couple of thousand dollars to a couple of hundred dollars. But as we scroll further up and as, as I spend more and more time doing more and more work and getting more leverage and equity in my, into my personal brand, you start to see the projects start to increase. So there's one for $6,000, another one for $6,800. $9,000 and you can see that this starts to snowball over time. It doesn't happen right away, but when you do more good work and you actually have strong case studies to showcase, then you have more leverage to create desirability for clients wanting to work with you. And let's keep scrolling up, let's go further up. Then we have a, my first project for $14,000. This is a deposit. Then we scroll further up. Once again, average is just one to $2,000, but as you spend more time, you're gonna increase your rates. 6,000, 5,000, 10,000, and it starts to snowball. 7,000, 20,000, 38,000, and it just goes higher and higher. So remember, freelancing is not an overnight success. And that leads me on to the last point, which is there is no secret 
for me generating $226,000 in the first year of freelancing. I have shared with you exactly step by step of all the key decisions and all the key milestones in my career and my journey, which really helped me to one, excel as a designer so I could become a master of my craft. And then two, the tactical things that I did to really get myself out there so people can become aware of the services and the value that I can deliver. Just remember, business is not rocket surgery and you don't need to overcomplicate it. First, just be a master of your craft. And then two is get people to know about your services. And then when you join the two together, that is where you can generate a lot of income and revenue. A lot of people become a master of their craft, but they forget to generate awareness about themselves. So that is why a lot of freelancers struggle. And hopefully with all these tactical insights that I've provided you, it really helps spark some ideas so you can start to really excel as a freelancer. However, what makes freelancing so fulfilling is that there are definitely a lot of small wins along the way that makes it extremely rewarding. So for example, I had the chief design officer from Microsoft who is now the VP of design at Uber personally reach out to me on LinkedIn to ask me to fly over to the States to join his team. Adobe also reached out to me and paid for an entire trip for me to fly over to San Diego in the States to attend the Adobe Max conference for free. I was also able to partner with Microsoft in an advertisement to promote the Service Book Pro. Now these are all opportunities that would have not happened if I was working full time and they only happened because I was freelancing and I was constantly getting myself out there and building my personal brand. So in part three of this three part series of how I became a seven figure UI and UX designer series, I will be sharing with you more details about how I was able to make my very first hire, how I was able to start to live a little bit of that influencer life, how I was able to collaborate and partner with Adobe and Microsoft in some of their projects, and ultimately how I was able to scale the entire operation from six figures from where I was in 2016 into a seven figure business. Also, if you wanna be part of my exclusive mastermind group, check the description below. I have left a link to the Mizco X mastermind group. We are a community of 31 people from all around the world right now, where we talk about business, life, design, and succeeding and becoming financially independent. Also, if you're looking to get into freelancing, I have a free masterclass to help everyone get started in freelancing for free. I've also left a link in the description below, so feel free to check that out. And once again, I hope you guys found a lot of value in this video. Much love from yours truly, Mizco.